Welcome to this video. This is the highlights video for round 11 of the candidates tournament in Kanti Mandisk, Siberia, Russia. And the 11th round means uh, there's only four rounds to go. Before the round, uh, former world champion Vichy Arnold is leading the tournament with the plus three score ahead of Levon Aronian with a plus one score. So one point behind, but Vichy has a better tie break and some players on 50%. So um, if um, if the other players want to have a chance to catch uh, Arnold, they need to get wins in. So let's see what happened today. Arnold having a crucial game here. That's Black against Kromnik. This is the first game I'm going to look at. And we got a Catalan opening. Not a big surprise. Um, the Catalan has been aligned in Kromnik's repertoire for a number of years. So it could easily be expected by Arnold. And um, we got this line, the classical, maybe the main line of the Catalan, where black first develops his kingside and then captures on c4. Yeah, here white has um, two ways to try to retrieve the pawn. Most uh, popular is queen c2, very often played by Kramnik or alternatively queen a4, mostly leading to the same position like that. This has been uh, debated uh, already a couple of times between both players. Um, this time, however, Kromnik goes for knight e5, a move that is, uh, of course, also well known and that he has played um, before as well, most notably in the candidates tournament last year against Carlsen in a very crucial game. Um, the best reply for black now is the move knight c6 that uh, could come as a surprise to some people who don't know the line. <clears throat> it is in fact um, the best move, forcing a direct decision, and it involves a pawn sacrifice. Um, the reason why this is the best move is that uh, while well, others simply don't uh, are not active enough, if black plays something like c5, he'll end up in a symmetrical pawn structure position where this bishop is so far better than the c8 bishop that uh, black can never really equalize. Knight c6, as mentioned, involves a pawn sacrifice because white can play just like Romnik did. Check. And here it's not a pawn sacrifice yet, but the c4 pawn is pretty much doomed. Black will lose this pawn and um, will need to show compensation for the material deficit. Here Kromnik played the move knight to a3, which is uh, almost a novelty, only two games played in earlier um, examples. He had played queen c2 against Garzen. This is uh, also had been a new idea at the time. Well, knight a3 here, and um, we see that after c5 and uh, the capture of the queen, bishop e3, black has a hard time to keep the pawn. As mentioned, we are, call we are talking about a pawn sacrifice, essentially, with this knight c6 move. Yeah, here the queen is attacked and uh, it has no way to protect the pawn. Something like that is simply delaying the capture. Black is going to h5. This is uh, the best move, I think. It uh, prevents this for the time being because this leads to excellent play for black, damaging white's pawn structure enormously. Um, white needs to prepare the capture with f3, and the pawn, as mentioned, is doomed anyway. And now Arnold plays very strong, he plays c3, best move in the position, returning the pawn while damaging the pawn structure, and also with queen a5, he attacks the knight, which is now not protected anymore by the b2 pawn. And this is the main problem, white's position is somewhat loose, this knight is loose, the bishop is loose, and the pawn is uh, is uh, weak. And uh, it turned out that after these moves, black always has this idea to capture and play queen a6 to gain the, the piece back. And white basically has uh, no way to keep the material. Kromnik took on a7, and after bishop c4, knight check. takes queen a7 check, queen e3. All this was forced. Now the point of all that, queen a6 attacking this knight twice, it needs to move. And after rook c2, black is counter-attacking two pawns and white will lose a pawn back. A 
couple of moves later, they had uh, traded even more pieces. And um, Check. exactly here agreed to a draw. Yeah, um, a very clean game, I think, by, by both players. Kromnik tried this uh, this idea that he, as he mentioned, the press conference had in store for a number of years and that he uh, well remembered just briefly uh, before he decided uh, to play the Catalan. But when he uh, had it on the board, he actually noticed that the whole idea against best play is not promising all that much. And exactly this best play is what Anand found over the board. So he's really in good shape. It's not like this is an idea that can uh, can knock you off easily or something, but uh, as it is so so uh, so great, so complicated and so on, it's certainly manageable to um, to diffuse it over the board. But Wishy is doing it, and uh, only um, can only um, admire his form in this uh, in this event. Really, a really flawless performance, I think. Yeah, a draw here, and which is uh, very much good enough for him to keep cruising. With his, uh, with his lead in the tournament. Okay, next game to look at, Swindler Aronia and two of, two of the guys who actually still have a chance. And uh, let's see what they played. Swindler plays uh, the, yeah, Knight F3, G3. This is not really a name yet. It's uh, it's turning into a red team. And here he took on D5. This um, already had been played in the last year's candidates by Kromnik with White against Seronia. So we follow this game. Swidler was obviously content with this uh, type of position, which uh, I actually know from my own games. And I always, um, yeah, I don't like it so much, to be honest, for White. I always think, think it's uh, it's very, um, very tedious structure. I mean, it's completely symmetrical in the center. You have the bishops, but they don't. Uh, they don't do. They don't do that much. This bishop is looking into a pawn. This is looking at a pawn. So this is a position that can only be very slowly opened by White. Very. Um, it's a very slow play, and um, I always thought that um, Black should be fine in this uh, structure. Yeah, um, we had some more moves. Black improving his pieces. Knight to d6. And now knight to e7. This is a very neat setup. This is um, basically preparing for white playing e4 at some stage, like here for example. After which black has a very nice blockade of the isolated pawn, will return to a good square and has no problems. e4 is one of the ideas that white still has in the position. But Swindler went uh, another way. He activated this knight and then pushed on the queen side. Yeah, Aronian is uh, putting up a very precise defense up to a point. And um, exactly here, after bishop e7, is the only point really in this game where there is um, something that Swiller could have done. Here e4 was an interesting try, which he didn't go for. The, the main line after this, or the critical line, um, is the move b6, which seems to be not good for black. But it's very difficult to uh, to figure out. White here can actually take on d5, which is a very strong move. It is, um, as usual, quickly pointed out by the computer, but for a human it is tricky. I think a human would consider the move, but after this it's a full piece sac sacrifice. And now capturing here. I, I believe if you... I, don't, I didn't see the press conference. Let me start this way. So I don't know why Swidler... Um, discarded the e4 idea. Um, it's possible that he came to this position and maybe thought, uh, okay, I might have compensation here, but uh, the computer uh, points out that this position is actually very, very good for, for white. It's uh, very difficult for black to, to, to find the defense here. White has this threat, which is uh, quite huge. So if, um, for instance, black retreats, yeah, bishop here, how do you, how do you uh, keep the knight now? It's very difficult to to see how. Let's say here, okay, Check. I'm taking and playing bishop d5 and just win. It's very very hard to defend the position. The computer is actually giving it as a very large advantage. So it seems that b6 is not really good after e4. So Aronian would have needed to take here probably, 
and we would have get gotten to, to a position of that type where white at least has the two bishops in a position that is opening up um, as um, and, and not 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 um, like in uh, in this closed structure with a pawn on e3 and everything's is uh, is closed and the bishops don't have uh, much scope so there is some chance here that he certainly what he could have tried i guess in the complications after b6 he didn't um he didn't really um yeah look at this um um, so, so deep as the computer is able to do. Okay, queen b1 was played and after knight d7 the pressure on c5 is so big that you need to allow exchanges. And with, um, yeah, a couple of moves later we had one pair of knights exchanged and now queens traded. Here they actually <clears throat> already agreed to a draw. Yeah, after this uh, white has the two bishops, okay. But uh, there's no way you're really going to make any headway here. Black can um, set up a fortress-like position with, let's say, knight d6 and f5, and white is never going to open the position. It's just too symmetrical. So uh, maybe there was a, a, a slight chance for Swidler here. You you never know if what Aronian is, uh, is playing if he goes e4. Maybe he had played b6, you don't know. Um, yeah, but a draw, so both uh, don't really catch up to, to Arnold. Okay, next game, Andrekin Mabedyarov. Uh, Mabedyarov is on 50%, so it's one of the guys who has, has still has a minimum chance to catch Arnold. Um, however, in this game, they relatively quickly set up a Catalan <clears throat> position, where now Andrekin uh, took on c5, which is a quite a conservative choice. It uh, allows a queen trade, this was played, and now c3, black is um, giving the pawn back to somewhat a worse white's pawn structure. This is a well-known line, which is believed to be between a slight edge for white and equality. And we see that um, Andrekin is getting some, some activity, but Mamedyarov, look at the clock. He's playing all this out of his preparation. He absolutely knows what he's doing. And after this, he played the move a5, and this is quite strong. White is now faced with a concrete idea. If he plays um, a nothing move, then there's a4, knight moves, maybe here, and uh, knight to a5. And this is the target now, and uh, it's not very nice for white. You don't really uh, want that. This is why Andrekin played a4, just stopping this altogether. And now after bishop e8, we have got a trade. And here, it's actually quite interesting position. White um, needs to um, think about the queen side. If you play it very slowly and don't do much, it might happen that uh, you get a blockade, or get this pawns blockaded. So for instance, a3, knight b4. If you now do a nothing move, again, let's say something like that, there is this idea, and black might be able to fix both pawns and actually play against those. This is probably not too great. It's more likely to be better for black. So white went with a5, uh, with c5, sorry, and uh, took a5 now. And uh, well, this is uh, just very drawish now because white will, well, no matter what black does, go here, and we have a trade: the c pawn for the b pawn. And it turns out that after a couple of moves, check. We have even rooks traded, and now we have an endgame with pure bishop pair against bishop and knight, which should uh, theoretically favor white, and uh, certainly it does here. But the symmetrical pawn structure without black having any serious weakness points out that uh, this will be a draw. They uh, played this on for a while, or let's say uh, Andrekin did, because he's the one with the bishops and. The, 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 the ideas at least to try to advance a bit, but uh, it's simply too symmetrical. Black is just defending all the pawns and stays put. Yeah, here with some tactics, even we got a complete Check. trade down of, uh, of all pieces. And this is just a very easy draw with the king always blocking the g-pawn. So pretty much, uh, pretty much eventless game. Um, which is uh, somewhat due to the opening, where after 
this white was basically forced to wrap the game up with c5 otherwise he would be worse so um yeah nothing great happening here for mamed yarov he, i think he would have needed a win to have any sort of chance but okay it's um it's just uh, just a draw this game okay to palov kayakin Kayakin also on 50%, while Topalov is on minus 2 and completely out of it. Kayakin has some slight chances because he still plays Vichy with white, but uh, still he needs to win another, uh, another game to really catch up. Let's see what happened here. We got to an English double fianchetto with uh, b6 and g6. All this has been played uh, a number of times. Yeah, and now a g4 was played an interesting move that uh, tries to push the knight away we um, got to an interesting position why this um, has transferred his knight over to g3 getting this uh, traded and uh, this has led to an interesting pawn structure with white having double g pawns and this g pawn on g5 is always a bit of an annoyance it keeps this square under control so knight f6 is not possible and it uh, yeah um, secures wide space advantage yeah kayakin is playing this queen a8 maneuver pretty typical setting up pressure on the long diagonal there's also this the idea of playing knight e5 at the right moment so white is deciding to um, make sure that this uh, situation is clarified and now queen to h1 very funny move and uh, I must show, uh, I must share with you the the name that I found uh, in in a block um, for this uh, formation Ratty's rifle like it. Oh, this was always one of my my favorite uh, configurations and chess the queen in the corner with the bishop in front of it Ratty's rifle. Okay, um, but uh, when two rifles fire at each other, uh, well they they won't survive so long. So look at the rifles they just traded and uh, knight d3 now we've got another trade this is however an end game i think that where white should have a very little advantage and um, this is due to the pawn islands black's got three pawn islands those three and white only two and this is a slight weakness on b6 so white should be somewhat better but um, somewhat later topalov played a very radical move and uh, this is fairly typical of his style. He's not the kind of person who sits and waits. He now played the move a5, a big breakthrough on the queen side, which led to a crisis around the b6 pawn. Yeah, in fact, black can attack it quite often. And um, after rook a2, yeah, this makes sense. Rook b2 is really not uh, doing anything with black pushing the a pawn. After um, rook a2, Black just took it. This is basically an exchange sacrifice after rook a to b2. Yeah, here black could have played a4, but this is probably also leading just to a draw. So he took on e3, which led to position with white having an extra exchange, an extra exchange. And uh, black has got two pawns and he's got an a pawn, dangerous pawn always supported by the bishop and he's got the h pawn potentially um so very far apart those two uh, passes it seems that after a couple of moves exactly Check. in this position here black had um, a very strong move pointed out by dutch grandmaster Irvin lamy on twitter and he posted that doesn't a3 win he, he said, if I'm not mistaken, he, he believed it wins, but he wasn't 100% certain, which uh, I understand, really. Um, I, I only had limited time today, so I couldn't really come to a conclusion if it wins, but it seems to be um, <clears throat> exceptionally dangerous. The point is that in a position like that, Black has the idea to play e4. For example, if he tries to, to stop the a-pawns, huh? Black will play e4, <clears throat> fe, king e5, and he intends to pick up this pawn or pick up d3. This can uh, very quickly lead to problems for white. For example, if he takes the takes here, there's the h-pawn running. This is uh, already not stoppable anymore. 
So um, maybe you need to go here to try to stop it. Yeah, I go king d4 and uh, it can again be be really, really quick uh, white losing like this. Oops, and again the h pawn runs. Um, it is very tricky. I cannot really in this uh, summary video post uh, what, what I had, what I was able to um, to um, to analyze. Uh, it wasn't that much. I admit that I did, couldn't really come to a conclusion. But I think my um, my gut feeling is black should win this. But I couldn't really uh, wrap it up completely with uh, concrete analysis. Um, Kayakin played <clears throat> the move bishop to f2, and after rook h8, it somehow turned out to be um, a position where the rook is always guarding the h-pawn and the king is always guarding the a-pawns and black is not able to make any progress. He cannot um, he cannot um, reach this type of um, activity with e4 anymore that was shown in the other line. So after a couple of moves they um, played like that and now agree to a draw because there's simply nothing to do. Black cannot improve, white cannot improve, so a draw is um, completely logical. Um, let's, um, to wrap this up, take a quick look at, uh, at the tournament standings. So here's the cross table taken from the Weekend Chess, a good online chess magazine. Let's see, uh, Arnand, seven points, had one point of Aronian plus the better tiebreak. So Aronian actually needs to overtake Anand to, to get the qualification. And uh, followed by Mamedyarov, Kayakin, Svila on 50%. So it's one and a half points, basically, for all of them. And um, there are just three games left. Anand has three games left, and I can tell you uh, the opponents. He's playing Andrekin with white, which seems like a game that he shouldn't lose, really. Maybe press a bit but don't uh, get crazy. And uh, then he's playing Kayakin with black. This is obviously a very important game. And he's playing white in the final round against Swidler. So the only scenario really to, to be halfway realistic um, to see Vichy not qualifying is uh, that he loses to Kayakin or Swidler. Being, uh, this, this would lead to have him having, uh, having a worse tiebreak losing to one of uh, those two guys and um, the other ones just winning another game. So let's say Anand draws against Andrekin, he loses against Kayakin, plays a draw against, uh, against Swidler and Kayakin wins another game. Then, uh, then uh, the qualification spot wouldn't go to Anand. It's still possible. It's not like he's already, uh, already through. Um, however, it can end really, really quickly if uh, in the next round he's got white against <clears throat> Andrekin, if I'm not mistaken. I think this is the the first game of uh, of the three. Um, if he wins that, that's that's basically uh, then then it's basically over. Uh, no way that they would uh, catch him then. So um, I I personally would estimate Anand's chances to qualify. Um, at about 90% at this moment. And uh, to be perfectly honest, um, it would have been a very, very deserved qualification. He's the only player not having lost a game. All other players have lost two games at least. And um, this um, is really a big difference. One point and one and a half points is quite a lot. But uh, okay, there are still games to be played. And um, if Arnold loses one game, it will get very, very tense quickly. This is quite clear. But uh, the other the other players simply don't win enough games. I mean, and um, today four draws. I mean, it's it's, it's just uh, it's just not looking like it <laughs> to be to be honest. Um, okay, so let's see what uh, what happens tomorrow. I'll be covering this round as well, of course. Thanks for watching.